In this video, physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist Dr. Larry Miller talks about how moderate and severe brain injury is a lifelong condition, the importance of getting collateral information about the survivor's functioning from the family or caregiver, and the importance of the family member and caregiver advocating strongly to get necessary services for the survivor. Hi. I'm Dr. Dan Gardner, and I talk about traumatic brain injury. And today I'm pleased to be speaking with physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, Dr. Larry Miller. Traumatic brain injury recovery. Welcome, Larry. Good morning. Larry, tell me a little about your background and how you got into the area of brain injury. Well, I became a resident in physical medicine and rehabilitation in the early 70s. And these patients I took care of included strokes, spinal cord injury, brain injury, multiple fractures, multiple sclerosis, all sorts of disability. When I started in the early 70s, in my training, I looked at brain injury patients as kind of stroke type patients. Mm -hmm. And even younger people were younger people with stroke and really didn't have much experience in the long-term follow-up of these patients. Although a few centers around the United States were starting to get interested in specifically brain injury, including Rancho Los Amigos that came up with a Rancho scale, which gave different levels of recovery and training at NYU. And then uh, when I came to California and started practicing, I became more interested in specifics of brain injury. And other than Rancho, I believe my program was the first one in Southern California to set up a formal brain injury team. So we had speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, brought in a neuropsychologist, mm -hmm. and we set up a nice formal brain injury program. Uh, people from my program ended up going to other hospitals to set up their brain injury programs as well. How does a physiatrist deal with brain injury patients? Well, I look at it more as a rehabilitation physician. Neurologists generally you think of as dealing with brain injury or neurosurgery. And of course, when somebody comes into the hospital with a moderate or severe brain injury, they're evaluated by the neurosurgeon, a neurologist. They have MRIs and scanning to determine their issues. They can be treated by intensive care unit if necessary with multiple re problems. But once they're stabilized and everything is done, then they need to go through a rehabilitation recovery process. And that's where I would come in or rehab physician. There are mm -hmm. neurologists that have training in rehabilitation and focus on neuro rehab, and they are excellent too. But the general local neurologist, generally, after they see the patient and say, yes, they have a brain injury, really do not know how to follow up and manage these patients. So that's what I do. And then I run a team. So I have PTs, OT, speech therapists, psychologists, neuropsychologists, social workers, and all sorts of people, and psychiatrists, of course, mm -hmm. um, to help in managing these patients. And then we work on a continuum. And a paper I presented early in the 80s talked about the con continuity of care, which became very important. It's not just we take care of them in the hospital, but what happens when they don't need to be in the hospital? Where do they go from there? Do they go to home? Do they have outpatient programs? Do they have subacute programs? Do they have supported programs that continue with the rehabilitation and care of these patients? So you really work with a wide range of specialties. You're the captain or the facilitator of the team, and you take a very long-range view of traumatic brain injury. I do. And maybe based on that paper, uh, I had an opportunity, a unique opportunity, to work with long-term brain injury patients, um, not in California, but another state, mm -hmm. that a state workers' comp program hired a rehab nurse manager and a team, including myself and a psychiatrist and a neuropsychologist, mm -hmm. to follow all the brain injury patients in the state. Not only the acute ones where we would make recommendations, and not only those that some of them we would transfer to my program in California to treat and manage, but the long-term cases that Workers' Comp was responsible for their lifetime care. And they wanted to see how they were doing, if they were getting appropriate services, so I would fly all around the state and see people five, 10, 
20 years or more after their brain injuries to see how they were doing in the different types of settings they were in from settings which were basically low-level brain injury programs to supported living programs mm-hmm. to with families and those that were trying to get by independently. So that was really a fascinating experience that most rehab doctors don't get based on the <laughs> practice. Right. And Larry, you're also pointing out something that maybe some people and even physicians aren't really aware of is that traumatic brain injury is a lifelong condition. Exactly. And these patients, uh, some patients will make full recovery. I had a patient who was on a snowmobile and crashed into a tree, unfortunately, and had a, was in a coma for a week and then spent about a month in the hospital. And now she is, this was when she was in her early 20s, and now she is a PhD psychologist. (laughs) Very fortunate recovery. Can you tell me about some other cases with with whom you've worked and what sort of injuries they had, how you intervened, how you worked with them, and some of the outcomes? Well, um, we're only going to talk about the moderate to severe brain injuries. There's a lot of talk about concussions and mild TBI, but that's a whole other topic. But let's talk about the more serious cases where patients really are in a coma for a while or have substantial cognitive impairment, thinking, processing, memory, behavior. And uh, some of them uh, need a special approach. We learned early on that sedating patients that go through a recovery where they become aggressive and agitated isn't effective. It stops their recovery. So we learned to stop the sedatives and tranquilizers and help them work through that. Uh, We also learned that when we see patients following up, It's not just so much what a therapist thinks or a neuropsychologist thinks. What's important is to hear from family members or others. We call that collateral source. Absolutely. Patients from a day in and day out basis and listen to what they say because that's very important. You can get a snapshot when you hear feedback from the speech therapist, the neurologist, the physical therapist, but the family member has the whole movie. Right, and that's what's so important, to follow with them and then deal with that. Some patients will need long-term behavioral issues, and they'll need to be on medication, maybe antidepressants or tranquilizers if necessary. Um, I had one patient who was in a wheelchair, was very aggressive, even several months after his brain injury, and he was being overly sedated, and when he wasn't sedated, he would become agitated, he would hit the staff, things like that. And then we found out certain things didn't work well, and we gave him hormones, female uh-huh. hormone treatment, mm-hmm. and that calmed him down so that he could be off the sedatives and behave normally or didn't have any more of those outbursts, which was exciting. Uh, uh, behavioral issues are a problem, especially younger women Um, may lose their inhibition from being overly friendly and become, lose their sexual inhibitions too. And that's a problem when otherwise they are pretty normal and can function or able to drive and go places, but then they don't have that proper behavior. And I had a husband who came to me once, he was very upset at workers' comp who was covered providing day attendant care for his wife but she didn't need it anymore. He thought that she would be out in the community and uh, because of her lack of inhibition would be sexually abused by mm-hmm. men who might run into her because she would be so be very vulnerable. That's right. So that's an issue with people. I've also had some funny stories about a young, there was, I had a young patient who wouldn't talk and we would, try to go in in the hospital and converse with her and she was awake and alert, followed directions, but she wouldn't talk. And then we found out once when we were in the room that if somebody called her on the telephone, she would talk on the telephone. Really? So what I did, these were the old days where there were two patients to a room. I would come in and I would get on the phone with the other patient's phone, call her, And even though I was standing right in front of her with the phone, holding it and talking, she would talk to me (laughs) on the phone. I've never heard of that before. 
<laughs> so a very a lot of very interesting comments. But mm -hmm. the problem is we have to work with the patients and their families and significant others because they have to understand as we're going through the routine what they can do and not. I've had mothers with children, even though they're aren't swallowing well and they're aspirating and food would go into their lungs would give try to come in and sneak snacks to them because Ooh. they wanted it and you have to be so careful and try to keep explaining to them because family members just many times just don't understand the situation and that's why we always have our psychologists work very carefully with those people absolutely larry what you seem to be pointing out also is that every person is unique there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to the treatment of brain injury. Exactly. Everyone is, I look at as an individual. And when I do my training at UCLA and training the residents, even with, especially with stroke patients, because there's way more stroke patients, that you have to look at everyone as a unique individual and apply the understanding and principles that you know to the treatment of each patient. You bet. You mentioned some clinical examples, and you've had many years of experience and wisdom that you've accumulated. What have been your biggest challenges and what have been your biggest satisfactions working with this population of patients? Well, the biggest challenges are the lack of, let's say, funding to give every patient the best care possible. Mm -hmm. And depending on what they have in their insurance or Medi-Cal, they get varying levels of care. Most people will get the care they need and rehabilitation once they come through the hospital and they go to rehab. However, if let's say they're very low level and they're more mostly semi-comatose or minimally responsive, when they get better, they don't get referred for more intensive rehabilitation. Right. And, and I've been seeing that a lot over the years. And when I'm involved, I will make those recommendations and try to arrange that. But that's only the people I end up getting to see. I'm sure there are many more that aren't getting that. Yeah, they that's have, that's been my experience as well, that they might get very intensive and high quality care initially in the acute hospital, in the acute rehab, post-acute and so on. But then when they go home, or to another residence, the question is, what quality of engagement in life do they have? Right. And the second issue is even the higher level patients that have memory problems, have cognitive problems, and they go home and they aren't referred to a rehab physician and nobody sees them and they don't get any more therapy and they just basically stop at that level when they could certainly have improved with more intervention and training. And, and that's a problem too, and it's expensive. And then we have patients that need help and assistance. They can't live alone. Mm -hmm. and we have wonderful supported living programs that you're aware of where they're apartment type programs and they have adequate staffing for their different needs, but they're expensive and many people can't afford it. So they either live poorly on their own <clears throat> or they can become homeless or they deal with their family and are a big burden for the family. Absolutely. So let's say resources were not an issue. One suggestion I believe you, you just made is high quality, good quality, and safe and healthy supported living programs. What other suggestions do you have for? Well, back in the early 80s, I had worked with a group of families and developed a network in LA for families with patients with head injuries. Yeah. That was, yeah. A, I'm sure there are multiple programs around. There was a National Head Injury Foundation available. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most large cities have that. Mm -hmm. uh, although it's hard. I went to Denver a year or two ago to see somebody, woman who still had residuals, really had cognitive deficits, memory, her husband was really burdens taking care of her. And then we had to try to find out where she should go. Yeah. Where should she live? And the husband, they were in their 70s, and there was no family in the area. Hmm. So it's complicated. So we said, well, where do you want to end up going? Uh, we recommended a good uh, brain injury rehab facility in Denver that they we recommended they follow up on. Mm -hmm. But then we discussed they had an opportunity to move 
and they had a relative in the Bay Area, California, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And we talked about maybe going down there and being involved with the brain injury program so that if something happened to him, she could move to a supported situation and be taken care of. Right. She wouldn't be isolated and abandoned if something happened to him. Right. Because the way she was, if she would have tried to live by herself, it would have been just so difficult. Then the other choice would have been that she would have either had to go in a regular assisted living facility or an Alzheimer's type unit, which would not be the best interest for her. Larry, what advice do you have for brain injury survivors, for their families, and what advice do you have for healthcare treaters? Well, for the families, I would just ask them to look for resources, talk to their doctors, to insurance, see what's out there in the community for brain injury, and do whatever they can to try to hook up with those services to educate themselves as to what's out there, what they can do. And for the providers, Uh, That's another story. I think they should not look at somebody who had a brain injury and not try to identify with the family what the issues are. So we'll go back to the collateral source. They should not just what they see if they come into the office and they look very normal. They might look just perfectly fine and talk well and Mm -hmm. say that they're fine because many people with brain injuries aren't aware of their deficits and see what the family says and then let the family know even though the provider may not know what resources are available they can encourage the family to seek them out and one other area there's just a problem are patients that i best would say kind of can't do the job well and i developed some programs and some little activities to to tease that out for instance um even back in the early 70s, I developed what I called a coffee test, where we asked uh, patients to make a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And they had to boil water, put Sanka in the cup, Mm -hmm. know where the cups were. And we found all kinds of problems where some patients would keep asking again to remind them what to do. Mm -hmm. We said two teaspoons of sugar and a little bit of milk. and And there was a kitchen set up that they didn't remember or they would try to hold the kettle without taking a pot holder <laughs> to mm-hmm. the themselves, mm-hmm. forget to turn off. Sometimes they would just pour the water and over pour it, or, and then they would add the coffee on top of the water instead of putting the coffee in first. Mm-hmm. This was very interesting. And then- in it's, a very, the, it's a very good real life test. It was, I presented that. And then in the 80s, I didn't present it, but I uh, came up with another little chore to see how high-level patients did. And what we would do is they would have them make up charts. The speech therapist would have a folder, and you would punch the uh, templates of, to put in the folder. There were four pages uh, to fill out you know, for initial evaluation. So we asked people to go and make 10 copies of a folder. And we gave them the four pages and we gave them the folder and the punch cards and the Xerox machine. And it was fascinating to see uh, many people that were really high level that went in and used and was able to punch the holes and go in and use a machine and make copies ended up just doing a sloppy job. For instance, they would put, you see in the folders, there would be two of the same page in the one folder or pages would be sticking out because they did such a sloppy job that it wouldn't be neat, it would be sloppy. And when we talked to the family members and they would say, oh yes, we can't have them wash dishes and put them away because we'll go and we'll see the dishes still will have food on them, it will be wet. And they just don't, some of these people just don't have the ability to perform even a simple task completely. And uh, this is an issue that's really bothersome for them and the family. So these can be, and unfortunately, in those kinds of patients, I haven't been able to help them so much, but you just have to know that those are the kinds of people that have to be supervised in doing their tasks. Absolutely. And, And these tools that you just described, the coffee test and the folder organization, are valuable parts of an assessment. 
the patient can tell you what he or she is doing or capable of doing, the family can report, but then if you give that assignment, you can see in your own eyes how well they completed. Exactly, and I do that when I see family members. Uh, sometimes there are legal issues and there's litigation and uh, the patient says he's fine and doing fine and he looks fine and he does fairly well on his neuropsychological tests. But then when I talk to the family and say, is this an issue? And they go, oh yes, you should see this what this guy did, and I asked him, my husband, to do this and this, and look what he came up with, and then they'll come back and bring in a really sloppily done project, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and it really shows everybody clearly that there's still a lot of problems. Absolutely. So, Larry, we've talked about your experience. You talked about some clinical examples, some advice. Anything else you'd like to say or talk about? Uh, I just leave you with the comment that uh, there are organizations out there that can provide information to families and patients with traumatic brain injury, and they should really educate themselves about what is available and then do the best they can to try to seek intervention and treatment and care for the patients with traumatic brain injury, even though they may not get it from their insurance company or from their doctors. They have to just keep being proactive and seek it out and try the best they can to provide that intervention themselves and see what's available. It's so important that the families be strong advocates in, in this situation. Exactly. That's what it's going to take. Larry, I want to thank you very much for spending the time and effort to talk with me today, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Please like, subscribe, and comment on this video.